This morning we have uh, returning to us again, Dan Schrock, who's a professor at Associated Mennonite Biblical Seminary. And a Baptist. And a Baptist seminary. <laughs> and uh, also has a, a rather large group of people to whom he gives uh, spiritual direction. Last Sunday, he helped us to understand Julian of Norwich, an English mystic who lived 1343 to 1413. And now he will acquaint us with uh, another spiritual teacher, uh, John of the Cross. Uh, this uh, saint lived 1542 to 1591. He was uh, a citizen of Spain. And his most famous writing is Dark Night of the Soul. And Dan Schrock is the author of a book with that title that featured him. So he's uh, exploring familiar territory for him, perhaps new for some of us. I also want to uh, indicate that if you're getting a taste for these classics, there are 52 such persons in this book entitled Devotional Classics. And they include such worthies as Augustine, Bernard of Clairvaux, Francis of Assisi, Julian of Norwich, Catherine of Siena, Thomas of Kempis, and on and on. A few uh, from the 20th century, uh, but mostly uh, people whose work has um, been able to stand the test of time. So uh, I have one which I'd be willing to load out to see me. I see. Uh, Dan has brought his with him, and uh, even uh, June Yoder has brought hers with her. So anyway, uh, uh, that's a further resource. Dan, we welcome you again and uh, anticipate what you have to teach us. Thank you, Dick. I apologize that some of you were not able to hear me last Sunday, and we have made three changes in the room to try and help the hearing. Our big idea for this two-part series is that Christian spiritual growth is propelled by two basic movements. The first movement is to be aware to become more aware of God's presence and activity among us. And then the second basic movement is to offer our consent to that, to say yes to God. Last Sunday, as Vic said, we talked about Julian of Norwich, who devoted her life to these very things. In addition, she models for us this splendid uh, mix of community, solitude, and service. Today I want to talk about John of the Cross, but before we get there, it might be useful just to say a little bit about uh, compare and contrast Julian and John. Julian lived in the 13th century, John in the 16th. Julian was English, John was Spanish. They are different genders, obviously, but neither one of them married, as far as we know, but remained single all of their lives. And both were, in their own way, highly creative theologians who advanced our understanding of the relationship that God has with us. Julian has been called one of the most sophisticated theologians in English history, while John has been called one of the most advanced cartographers or map makers of the Christian spiritual life. That was uh, a title given him by a Dutch uh, researcher. The man we know as John of the Cross was born into a peasant family in Spain in 1542. He had two brothers and no sisters. He was the youngest of the three. His father died when these boys were young John himself was only two years old, so really didn't have much of a memory of his father, raised largely in a single parent household by his mother. From that point forward, because there was one income gone from the household, from that point on, the family was very poor and often hungry. 
And there is some speculation that the middle son, uh, who died when he was young, may have been, uh, died from famine. However, John was intellectually gifted and caught the eye of a wealthy patron who sent him off to school. He eventually completed three to four years of education at the University of Salamanca, which at that point in time was on par with Oxford University in terms of the quality of its education. So this is one of the leading uh, universities in Europe. And of course, not many Spanish boys or young men were given that opportunity. When he was still a young man, John met Teresa of Avila, who was a spiritual giant in her own right. It is very difficult to talk about John with also, without also talking about Teresa of Avila, because the two of them were collaborators. And I think we have to, as I read the history, we have to say that uh, Teresa, who was 27 years older than John, was actually the leader in, of, the, of the pair. She was the senior partner in the relationship. He was the junior partner. And yet, toward the end of his life, their roles kind of reversed because he became her spiritual director. These two persons, Teresa and John, were reformers in the Carmelite movement. The Carmelite order had begun back in the 1100s in, uh, in the Middle East. And during the 16th century, this order had become kind of flabby, shall we say, and riddled by uh, competition and social the tension within the monasteries between the rich and poor. And Teresa came along and said, you know what, this is just not working. This is not very good for us. And so she instituted this reform movement and enlisted John as her helper in the reform. This reform movement eventually became a separate order called the Discalce. Carmelites. So now today we have two Carmelite orders, the Carmelites of the ancient observance, the old ones, and then the Discalced Carmelites, which Teresa and John co-founded. Discalced just means without shoes. So this was a group of uh, men and women in, their early, uh, in the early years of the movement who wore sandals rather than shoes. And that was a distinctive characteristic. Very uh, committed to poverty uh, as a way of identifying with poor. Uh, John died, as Vic said, in 1591, a uh, relatively young age of 49, and it was because of a skin infection that uh, sort of metastasized. It was not cancer, but it got worse and eventually killed him. In his vocation as a Carmelite priest, John exhibited the same characteristics that we noted last week in Julian of Norwich. Like her, he was also devoted to community, in this case, to his fellow Carmelites scattered around Spain, to solitude, which he found in small chunks in a very busy life, and to service, which largely took the form of offering spiritual direction to other people. If I had to uh, sort of rank John's roles in his life, I would say that primarily he was a spiritual director. Secondarily, he was a poet, about which I will say more. And thirdly, he was a prose writer. So if you read the excerpt out of that book that Vic introduced to us this morning, uh, you will see the prose side of John, but that's actually tertiary in, I think, the hierarchy of what he found important. Uh, John 
was not an anchorite like Julian of Norwich. He did not live permanently in any one location. He was quite peripatetic. He wandered around Spain, this was all by foot, by the way. So he walked long distances to visit these various Carmelite communities. Stories about him say that as he walked from one place to another, he would often recite from memory extensive scripture passages. This guy was thoroughly steeped in scripture, and a lot of it was up here in his noggin. For the sake of human interest, you might like to know that John was balding man, was uh, four feet, 11 inches tall, and was reputed to love eating garbanzo beans. Garbanzo beans. He had a reputation and his personality was uh, to be kind and compassionate, patient with other people. He was not prone to flares of anger at other people. He also sought to love his enemies. And from an Anabaptist Mennonite perspective, that's kind of crucial. Most Catholic writers about John don't notice that. But as a Mennonite, I do. He didn't simply talk about loving his enemies, uh, which happened in a few of his letters, but he actually lived it, especially at the end of his life, where there were a lot of people out to him. And from, in my judgment, he was largely successful in that project to love his enemies. I said John was mainly a spiritual director, what he called a spiritual guide, that's his preferred language, and he met with both women and men. Historians are inclined to think that probably most of his directees were actually women, not men. That may suggest that he is in, as, as you read him, that he is very much in touch with female spirituality to the extent that that might be different than male spirituality. In any case, John was an accomplished poet who used his poems in the course of spiritual direction. So what would happen is that he would have these conversations often with women, and they would ask him questions about what was going on in their own spiritual lives. Well, he would notice things about what was going on in their spiritual lives. And then he would write poems, which he gave them as uh, pieces to meditate on and reflect with in hopes that the poetry might propel them forward in the spiritual life. And then what happened is that they would come back to him and say, um, we don't understand this poetry. Can you explain it to us? And that's when he started writing prose commentaries on his own poetry to try and say, this is one possible set of meanings of poem. Now, some of his poems actually are not that good. And I say that as a former English major, it's just really not that good. But three of them, The Spiritual Canticle, The Dark Night, and The Living Flame of Love, are today considered to be among the finest poets in Spanish literature. And uh, they are so fine that I uh, understand Spanish uh, school children learn these things in uh, their education, not necessarily from a religious point of view, but just simply because they're good poetry. An interesting characteristic of these three poems is that they never mention God. Now, in the superscription or the introduction to two of the poems, John explicitly makes a connection to God. But in the body of the poem itself, he never mentions God. A little bit like the Song of Songs, huh? or the Book of Esther, both of which don't mention, and neither of which mention God either. Now, at first blush, 
this seems unaccountably odd. Why would John, who is such a passionate follower of Jesus, and who is so thoroughly soaked in scripture, why would he invest his precious time crafting lyrical poems that never mention God. These three poems talk endlessly about love, but not about God. Why? Endlessly about love, but not about God. Why? One answer is that for John, the ordinary things of human life are doorways that open us to God. In one of these three poems, the spiritual canticle, he describes the passionate love between two human beings. This, you should be thinking of the song of songs in the background here, and that's where he's getting some of this. The poem is set in the rural Spanish countryside and is filled with descriptions of shepherds, deer, Mountains and watersides, flowers and meadows, doves and foxes. And in case, uh, yeah, I already said that before. I sometimes get so excited about talking about John that I uh, sort of leap ahead and uh, say things that are coming in my notes later. To give you a flavor of, of what these three poems are like, I'd like to read to you the first two stanzas of the spiritual canticle during this English post. Where have you hidden, beloved? So the capital B. Where have you hidden, beloved, and left me moaning? You fled like the stag that wounded me. I went out calling you, but you were gone. Shepherds, you who go up through the sheepfolds to the hill, if by chance you see him whom I love the most, tell him I am sick, I suffer, and I die. You hear the resonance there with the Song of Songs and the Song of Solomon? There are 39 stanzas in that poem, and they continue much in the same manner as those first two I read. Now, the things in this poetry are quotidian. They're just everyday things of life. All of us have known love in one way or another. And all of us, I dare say, are thirsting or have thirsted for more love in our life. It's something that is never quite fulfilled in us, this longing for love. That's what John is writing about. It's what he's trying to touch. If we're fortunate, we were loved deeply by our parents or grandparents. Even if that didn't happen in quite the way we wanted, maybe we fell in love with somebody else. Or maybe we had friends with a strong bond of love between us, sort of like the biblical David and Jonathan. If we had children, we learned to love them more than words can tell, even in spite of their idiosyncrasies and sometimes downright cussedness. And yes, I am speaking from my own personal experience as a father here. <laughs> love, even if our love is a bit vexed, is a normal, natural part of being human. But also, but creation is normal as well. Here in Indiana, we are blessed with oaks and maples, squirrels and rabbits, horses and cows, daffodils and mums, robins and cardinals and hummingbirds. Right now in our house, we are blessed with mice in our basement. <laughs> Number four, Matt Chip's fake last night. 
At this point in the year, with fall sashaying into winter, we're not going to be spending much time outdoors anymore, but we can still sit in a comfortable chair by the window and gaze lovingly, gratefully, prayerfully at the visual feast of creation outside. These ordinary things can become gateways to God. And that is one of the gifts that John of the Cross has for us. He points us to the ordinary, everyday dimension of our lives and invites us to look there for God. Last Sunday, I mentioned the Christian belief of omnipresence that God is inescapably everywhere all the time. Well, that means that God is with you in your condo or apartment, that God rides along with you when you go to the grocery store, that God hovers in the aisles when you pick up your medicine in the pharmacy. In a sense, John encourages us to finger the tangible parts of our lives. And through those things, to become more aware of God who is expressed in those tangible things. That 53-year-long marriage to your spouse was probably in some way a doorway to God. God came to you through that marriage. You accessed God partly through that marriage. The art hanging on your wall may be a visible sign of a deeper spirituality that lies behind and beyond the artwork. That loaf of bread on your kitchen counter is a symbol of the unending communion between you and God. Therefore, John once again points us to our big idea that our spiritual growth partly depends on becoming more aware of God and then giving our consent. We'll have time to talk about this uh, in a little bit, but for now, I invite you to muse about the aspects of your life that open up the reality of God. Then then these shift around from person to person, right? Uh, For some of us, it's visual art, or maybe it's music, or maybe it's reading, or being with friends. You know, any number of things can open uh, us to God. I mentioned the beauty of music and art, the glories of creation, whether orange or yellow leaves or scampering chipmunks. A treasured photograph that reminds you of a particular relationship. The love that sustains one or more of your relationships. Or maybe it's an image of Jesus that calls to mind his entire birth, ministry, death, resurrection, and ascension. When I was uh, growing up, there was a major piece of art by, I don't remember the painter anymore, painted in about 1890-something, that hung on the walls of our living room. It was a depiction of Jesus and two disciples on the walk to Emmaus. So right there, see, there's a visual image of Jesus with us in concrete ways, in the ordinary things of life. Or think of a simple supper of savory lentils and bread, followed by slices of apples and cheese. You don't have to be eating filet mignon in order to relate to God. It can be apples. 
These ordinary things help us to become more aware of God. Spiritual practices do too. I don't want to dismiss those. So you know, prayer and scripture, worship and music, solitude and silence, convivial conversation, all of these things can open us to God. But when we are open, when we become more aware, then the invitation that comes to us is to offer our consent. How then do we say yes to God in the everyday aspects of our life? Now, this is a crucial question, and we touched on it a little bit last week, because we older Mennonites, and I'm putting myself in this camp, we older Mennonites grew up in an era when saying yes to God meant having an active life of service to other people. In the name of Christ, we became teachers, nurses, social workers, plumbers, and missionaries. We cooked meals and delivered them to people going through a rough patch. We drove down to Florida and helped clean up after hurricanes. We signed up with the Mennonite Mission Agency and got on a boat for India. We served on boards and committees and raised the money for good causes. In all of these ways and more, we said yes to God. But how do we keep saying yes to God when we can no longer do any of those things? When cooking even one meal for ourselves is perhaps the most we can muster in a day. When our most important tool is not a hammer, but a wheelchair. This is a crucial question for we in, who are in the latter years of living. Perhaps once we measured our self-worth, our usefulness to God, by how much we could accomplish in the outer world of work. And now, when we cannot do any of those things that we're used to do, we might be tempted to think that we are not worth much of anything to God or others. We cannot do as we once did, and it depresses us. I have a simple suggestion about this, based on John the Cross. What if the latter years of our lives are a new opportunity for us to say yes to God's presence and activity within us? That's the difference. For a long time, we may have been focused on the outer world of work. But what if now the invitation is the inner world of spiritual work? What if we refocus from an outward yes to an inner, inward yes? Here again, John of the Cross offers us a way forward. In one of his books, he says that it costs God a great deal, a great deal of effort to get our souls to the place that God desires. God compared, I mean, John compares God's work to the work of a painter. A painter, uh, and I don't mean a house painter here, I mean an artist. A painter invests a great deal of money in paints, brushes, and canvases, and a great deal of time in composing the painting, choosing and mixing colors, and executing the brush strokes that are going to achieve the desired result. That beautiful painting is us, says John. God has invested a great deal to craft all that is good and holy inside of you. And God has been working on this project for decades. You know how long you've been living. 
You know when you were baptized. You remember when you were baptized. You know how long this project has been going on. Mm -hmm. You are not the same person that you were at age 16. And I'm not talking here about the condition of your arms and legs. I'm talking about the condition of your spirit, the state of your inner person. God has been working on that in you for 60, 70 years. In other words, God has a big investment in you. If you want to think about it in economic terms, there's a capital investment that God has made in you. Furthermore, John insists that a lot of the work God does within us is beyond our sight. We can't see it. We can't sense it or intuit it because it's hidden. Now, maybe our spouse or a good friend will see some of that work in us that we cannot see it for ourselves, but even our spouse and friends can't see everything. So the only person that sees everything that all the good that is within us is God. And God sees all the good that is there because God is the one who put it there. So the point here is that God is not finished with you yet. God has started, but God is not finished. Even if you get to be 100 years old, there is still more that God is planning to do for you. If not in this life, then certainly in the next one. So, our yes is a crucial requirement for God to continue doing the work in us that God wants to do. Now, God is not an, a mean ogre who runs rough, roughshod over us and does things in us that we don't want to do. We can say no, and God will, will respect that. So, this yes is a crucial part of spiritual formation. It's as if God is always hanging around, waiting for our yes, waiting patiently for our yes. Here's the thing. Often we don't know exactly what we're saying yes to, right? You've learned that. You, you, you say yes to marrying someone, and someone you've been married. Well, you're not quite sure. It's a bit of an uncertain thing because you're not sure what all you're saying yes to. It kind of works that way with God. We are invited to give our consent to God without knowing in advance everything that's going to happen to us after we say yes. Mennonite missionaries in the last century who said yes to God and then got on that proverbial ship to India had no way of knowing in advance what would happen to them. Well, this is simply part of the Christian spiritual life, whether we're talking about our inner lives or our outer lives. When we say yes to God, we are really saying yes to God as a person. At my age, I no longer pretend to know exactly how God will respond when I give my consent. There's, frankly, a lot about God that is a mystery to me. Even after the, all the theological education I've had, there's a lot of mystery there. And yet, I can say yes anyway, because I'm saying yes to the person. I have come to trust, maybe like you, God's character, God's values, desires, dreams, and matchless ability to accomplish what I cannot. John of the Cross says that uh, our life is an adventure in God. Now, notice his choice of prepositions. The adventure of our lives happens 
in God. No matter how long we live or what our circumstances may be, that adventure in God continues as long as we keep paying attention to God and saying yes. All right, let's talk with each other. So um, let me start with a uh, one question and we'll see where it takes us. You can talk about anything you want to. Um, I know one or two other things about John of Cross that uh, I could try and, I could try and respond to if you're interested. But let's start with this. For you, what are the ordinary portals or doorways into a relationship with God? And as I have said, that varies from person to person. But um, my question is. What makes you most aware of God's presence? Where are you when that happens? What are you doing? What are these ordinary things? You know, the, the bread, the manna and the quail, the wine and the bread of your life that opens up something, even if it's subtle. We are friends. Yes. Okay. I think for me that is prayer. Okay. Uh, no, I, I can no longer do certain things that I used to do, but I can still pray. Okay. That was Dale who said it's prayer for him. A lot of things he can't do anymore, but he can still pray. Yeah, I've known you a long time. So may I ask a follow-up question? And just you know, brush me away if you don't you're not interested. Well, Wait. Huh? I'm sorry? Well then. Well, well, well then. then. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's yeah, that's Dale. Yes. I'm sorry. I cannot see. Uh, sometimes I think I know who it is behind the mask, and I really don't. So another mystery game. All right. So um, well then. I don't know. What can I ask anyway? And again, you don't need to answer. Uh, when you pray and you experience yourself in communication with God, what is the feeling? What is that feeling or that experience like? What do you receive out of it? Assurance. Oh. Uh, advancement of my ability to think about to love God. Comfort, assurance, and a greater ability to to experience. Um, what was the word you used? The presence of God. The presence of God. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else want to offer something? Uh, we've got chats. Uh, we've got chats here. June. Well, for me, I would say listening. Hmm. Listening. Could I invite you to say more about that? Yes, you could invite me. You, <laughs> you know, I'd be able to talk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is something that's growing in me, but. Um, things come to me, and I'm learning to listening to them. Things come to you in the listening. 
And the more you listen and the more you, you gain, it's like a, a exercising the muscle. It gets easier as you go along. Depends what I hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Because sometimes God may say to us, uh, Dan, would you be willing to do? And then I'll say, no, not really. So that becomes a harder listening, perhaps. Harder to say yes. Harder to say yes, yeah. I hadn't really thought about this before, but uh, I love to make bread. And it's pretty amazing that you can put just a fourth of a teaspoon of yeast with some flour and water, and it will eventually, if you give it time, become something beautiful and taste. Phyllis, do I have that right? Phyllis Miller, yeah. So Phyllis Miller uh, says that she'd been baking bread for a long time, and just that one quarter teaspoon of yeast, along with you know flour and water and whatever else you put in the bread. Uh, results in something that's kind of miraculous. And so, if I may, Phyllis, uh, what does that open up for you in your relationship with God? I have to think about that more. Okay, all right. Because you're just initially, uh, for the first time, maybe making this connection. Yeah, okay, so of course you want to think about that. Uh, let me pose a, a different question. Uh, what helps you to say yes to God? Uh, what builds your capacity to trust God? To, you've been at this a while, right? We've, been all, we've all been at this a while. So do you have any sense this morning, uh, in this moment, what helps you to say yes to God? What makes that easier? History with God's faithfulness. Yeah. History with God's faithfulness. Sort of like, you know, I've been married to Jenny for uh, 35 years, is it? Yeah, 35. You better remember that. Yeah, I better remember, especially <laughs> since it was, uh, we had a major trip on Amtrak last summer to celebrate that. So, yeah, I better remember. Um, there are, so that it's a long, and we dated for five years before we married. So 40 years I've known this person, and it is actually good. Okay, so I'll be honest. God has come to me in this marriage through her. She's not perfect. Um, I was sort of muttering under my breath this morning about the way she stacks the dishwasher. <laughs> uh, and I redid it. But uh, you know what? I, I've been with her a long time, and it's that history that allows me to trust her. It's that way with God, too. Okay, one minute. Anything? Uh, I'm sort of like um, John of the Cross. And his poetry. Uh, for me, I rely at least partly on what has been written literature uh, through the ages, especially since the Renaissance. Now, John of the Cross, you can refer to the Song of Solomon, but really he's writing pastoral poetry. Yes. And that has a tradition that goes all the way back to the Greeks and the Romans. And in the Renaissance, it was revived, but uh, in a Christian sense, so that uh, Moses was a shepherd, 
and Jesus Christ was the good shepherd. So he's also looking back at the tradition of uh, secular literature that he inherited. And even if they're not overtly Christian writers, they all have insights that I can use. Um, and their language is my language and their experience is my experience, less so New Testament and Old Testament experience. So that's where I find illumination and uh, spirituality. Yeah. It's called um, theopoetics. Ah, yes. Called what? Uh, theopoetics. <laughs> uh, if I remember correctly, a term you introduced me to in <laughs> college. <laughs> so, <laughs> so for those of you on Zoom, this was Irving Beck, who talked uh, eloquently about <laughs> literature, which of course is his thing, but literature being a gateway to God, and the technical term for what he's talking about is theocoletics. Thank you. All right, Beck, uh, do we have, uh, John just put up his hand. Oh, yeah, John. Okay, no. John Smith, go ahead. No, I, I give the floor to you. Okay. <laughs> Oh, there's a chat. Okay, this is from John Lederach. Uh, St. John of the Cross did not use the word God. Say more about this in your talk. The word is used often. Uh, yes, okay, so um, succinctly, in the three poems that are his best, he never uses the word God, but if you read the commentaries on those poems, and there's one, um, there are four commentaries. And if you read those commentaries, the word God is, or Jesus, or spirit is on every page. And every page of his writings is uh, alluding to scripture in some way or another. So uh, he is, very much a theologian, but in his poetry, as Irvin rightly points out, he's picking up the long lyrical tradition that goes back to the uh, Greeks and Romans. Okay. 